Uh, well, good uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending uh, where you're dialing in from. My, my name is Brendan O'Donnell. Um, I'm a contractor supporting PEO Aviation and the vice chair of the, the face, uh, business working group, and I'll, I'll be uh, um, leading the uh, discussion here today uh, for the for the business overview portion of uh, the face-to-face -face meeting. It's great to see so many folks, and particularly you know, so many names that, that I don't recognize. So, um, so welcome. Um, if this is your first uh, face business overview session, and, and for those that are coming back, um, it's always good to kind of refresh the the, the why behind why we're doing this um, uh, or taking this face approach. Um, so agenda for today, you'll hear from uh, three speakers. Uh, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give the executive overview and. Uh, and talk to um, the conformance program and processes in the, in the FACE library. Uh, Jason York from PEO Aviation will talk about the contract guide and the business guide, and then Chip Downing uh, from RTI will um, uh, talk about some of the outreach uh, initiatives. So, um, just real, you know, as a, as a very high level, what is what is FACE? What is FACE? Um, it's, it's an open avionics standard. Uh, collaboratively developed under the auspices of the open group um, and um, with participants from um, government industry and academia. Um, it, it, it seeks to define a new um, uh, both technical and business approaches to developing and procuring uh, avionics software and um, uh, everything that uh, all of the, the sort of finished products that the consortium produces are uh, publicly available. Um, and we use the, um, uh, the internal processes for developing consensus um, um, from the open group. But the overall goal of, of, of FACE and the FACE approach is to get the best avionics software to the warfighter faster. And we'll talk a little more in depth uh, kind of what this means here, but, um, um, but that's, that's a very high level overview of, of, of why FACE. Um, well, a little more details of why um, or what the current landscape looks like that has driven us to the, the FACE approach. Um, historically, DOD uh, airborne systems have been um, uh, developed by a single vendor, um, and, and they've been developed to a unique set of requirements. Um, those, those are platform unique designs um, that, that um, in the past have not enabled reuse of, of software across programs. Um, there's um, high barriers to entry or, or high barriers to competition within and across platforms, so it's very difficult to get uh, new technologies sometimes onto uh, existing platforms. And it drives, you know, particularly from the, the government perspective, uh, the need to um, bundle software um, and, and um, prevent us from getting the latest um, um, most current software on platforms because we have to um, uh, kind of integrate them all together um, in, a, in a way that makes uh, uh, financial sense before we're able to put those uh, the, the latest and greatest software on our platforms. Um, the, the chart down there on the, on the lower right hand side talks to the increasing complexity of software um, over time and, and, and throughout uh, different platforms, both in the in the DOD space and, and in commercial aviation. And as you can see, you know, a generation or two ago, a lot of the capability in an aviation platform was, was in the hardware and the systems on the aircraft. And over time, that capability really um, now resides, you know, the, the increased capability resides in the software. And um, co commercial aviation was on a, um, um, a path of exponential growth from a software complexity and cost standpoint, um, they they put in some processes uh, to drive down or break that curve in order to um, uh, flatten it out and, and um, reduce the cost and, and time required to integrate uh, software. Um, and you know a lot of the 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 impetus for face came from some of those efforts to bring that uh, to the DoD uh, platforms. So. Currently or, or historically, we haven't been able to reuse software across platforms. There's no set of open standards, um, and, that, and for those that did exist, there was, it was very difficult to enforce um, um, uh, 
uh, conformance to those standards. Um, as importantly, the, the the acquiring aircraft organizations within DOD weren't funded or incentivized um, to look across the enterprise and, and uh, support reuse of, of software. Um, and so the face, the, the the organizations that started face realized um, that uh, perhaps a, a government industry collaborative uh, open standard may address some of those issues. Issues and uh, and face was born. Um, so I'll, let me tell you kind of a, from a very practical perspective what's this what this means to the the, the warfighter who's who's flying a, a DoD aircraft. And I'll use myself as an example. I'm a former Marine Corps um, attack helicopter pilot. Um, in 2005, I was a young captain in the fleet, flying fleet aircraft with no appreciation for any sort of uh, acquisitions or systems development. I was the squadron safety officer, which, which uh, each squadron has a school trained safety officer who's, who's responsible for the safety program within the, the organization and additionally is responsible for conducting uh, mishap investigations. While deployed overseas to Iraq, we were conducting a mishap investigation that was related to um, uh, some causal factors having to do with the way that the transponder was installed in the, the H-1 aircraft. Um, in, in that aircraft, the transponder was installed in the front seat, so two, two pilots, only the front seat pilot could change the transponder. And that transponder had mechanical um, dials, <clears throat> kind of plunger uh, buttons that needed to get pushed. That often got stuck, lots of sand got in there. And so um, at, at one point, uh, this, this um, mishap occurred because the pilots lost situational awareness due, due to the fact that they had to pass the controls to the pilot in the front seat in order to make a transponder change. Uh, within the, the course of doing that investigation, we, we developed uh, something called a hazard report, which, which gets promulgated out to the, uh, the aviation community. And um, uh, some folks came forward uh, with a potential solution that would replace that mechanical box, um, move it to the tail boom of the aircraft, and put the um, uh, the ability to change transponder codes within our, our CD and use or our comm nav system. That would enable pilots in either seat to change those uh, codes and then would eliminate the problems that we had with the mechanical uh, plunges. Um, and so we ran that up the process, again, as a, as a young captain in the fleet, did everything that we needed to do, and, and the response that we got back was, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to make that investment. Um, and, and when we pushed a little more, we said, this is, this is crazy. The, the, the cost to do this is not uh, that much per aircraft from what we had uh, discovered. However, um, the, the, what we didn't realize was that this happened with the hardware costs, but really it was the, the integration into the fleet of, of that new software that were prohibited. Prohibitive. Additionally, we had a, an upgraded aircraft that was coming coming out that would address this issue. Um, but the, the the type model series that we flew flew for another about 10 years with this same problem that never got fixed. From, from a fleet aviators perspective, something like FACE, uh, had we had that in place, may have um, reduced those software integration costs and been able to provide the latest technology out to the warfighter. So just a quick case study of. Uh, at a very practical level for what we think uh, FACE can improve and over the current way we field uh, technology. So looking at, at, at FACE, um, uh, and this diagram here asks the question about what is competitive about, about all these devices, and, and were we in the room together, I'd, I'd wait for an answer, but um, it's, it's uh, pretty obvious here. The, the, what's competitive about these devices is the application design. So uh, a light bulb can provide light in many different ways. It um, you know, provides different wavelengths. It provides, has different characteristics for the amount of heat it gives off, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, energy efficiency. Um, and all of those are competitive features of the light bulb. However, um, it would make no sense if every time you were, were you know, it wouldn't be efficient if every time you wanted to change the type of light bulb that you were using in your house, you had to go completely replace all of the uh, light bulb receptacles. So the interface to to the modern light bulb has been standardized, and there's an ANSI standard there that describes uh, the interface that that those light bulbs uh, need to use in order in order to be uh, uh, um, in order to be attractive to the marketplace. 
And this, at a very basic level, is, is what we're trying to accomplish with things. So on the left side, you see how we've traditionally developed uh, new technologies and fielded them into DoD aircraft, very low level integration. Um, the, each, on the left side, each of those technologies really uh, has a, a one-off or a 1x integration uh, cost and effort uh, for each of the, the platforms on the left-hand side. Um, with the, the, you know, all of the requirements that, uh, that, that the warfighters have, we just have too few dollars to uh, supply all of those, uh, those technology needs and we wind up uh, making, um, making trades over you know, what, what technologies we're gonna prioritize. On the, on the right hand side, uh, with the face approach and then looking at the, the face uh, sort of technical uh, architecture there that the, the, tech, the TWG overview will go into much more de detail. Um, the desire is to be able to develop um, those technologies and use them across multiple platforms. And so if we do invest in a, in a new uh, software uh, provided capability that we can um, um, not only use that on, as we would on the, on the left-hand side for a single platform, but that, that same um, software can be used across the fleet. The bottom line is uh, to be able to provide more capabilities to the warfighters for the, for, for the dollars that we're investing. And so that drives to kind of four characteristics of FACE. Um, affordability, drive down costs for, for both industry and government. Um, uh, speed, uh, it enable um, uh, fielding of technology at, at a more rapid rate, um, something that's been proven uh, in, the, in the commercial aerospace world. Agility, um, using common architecture and common uh, data, uh, models and, and data platforms, um, increasing interoperability across you know, the domain systems and capabilities, and then finally excellence driving, um, um, though, though FACE does not make um, claims about the technical performance as we'll, we'll see here in a minute about, about a FACE conformant software, we do believe that um, um, the FACE approach will support um, uh, the excellence in the development of aviation software. So the two major stakeholders that that you know are, form the members of the consortium and and really are the um, the beneficiaries of the face approach. On on the one hand is the government we've talked a bit about there, but but um, uh, the face approach uh, helps government uh, PMs. It helps uh, government technologists uh, address uh, policy mandates. So uh, you know there were some recent uh, guidance released um, in the form of the tri services. Memo. There's each of the services have been uh, promulgating updated policy and mandates re 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 uh, regarding uh, modular open systems architecture approaches. And so, FACE helps government systems engineers and PMs uh, address some of those um, those policy mandates. <clears throat> In addition, we believe FACE the FACE approach will enable the government to spend their investment dollars in a much more efficient way. So reducing life cycle costs, reducing uh, obsolescence issues, enabling uh, the government to spend their dollars on uh, fielding technologies to the warfighter. We believe FACE will allow us to do that uh, at, a, at a faster pace. So, you know, the example I showed before from my experience, um, you know, perhaps had the FACE uh, uh, ecosystem existed then, there would have been a, um, a, a faster path to be to enable the um, uh, increased capability that would have made sense from a 10-year horizon when it didn't make sense because we had a, a replacement uh, type model series coming. At the end of the day, we want we want to uh, support reuse in order to be able to drive uh, increased capabilities to the warfighter. Just as important, and, and I think something uh, that the FACE approach has done very well is in, in, in the development of the technical standard and these business approaches been very conscious of, of industry's role um, in developing software and their need to, uh, to make a profit. 
And so what are some of those benefits to the industry, you know, stakeholders within these? Um, obviously, the, the customer has uh, those policies and mandate, mandates we talked about earlier about open systems architectures, and FACE helps industry um, um, support the customer requirements. Um, FACE for industry can increase competitive opportunities. So in the legacy um, way of, of um, providing um, capabilities to the warfighter, on many of those platforms, the uh, you know uh, competition was effectively locked out because a, a vendor didn't win a spot on on the uh, on the latest and greatest um, platform that that was selected. Um, th those vendors had high barriers to entry, and and um, 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 because those were closed platforms. With the face approach, even if a, a, a particular vendor is not successful in getting in, let's just say on an initial acquisition of a platform, because that platform has uh, open architectures designed in, they can remain competitive uh, over the life cycle of the platform. So things that were previously closed to them uh, uh, under the face approach uh, are not. And then, you know, face is just a good way to do business as far as being able to uh, it, reuse software across product lines, um, drive down industry's time to develop new software, um, and, and uh, pursue product line approaches that uh, have a real return on investment. So for a long time in this brief, we talked about FACE as something that was coming. FACE that was, uh, from a business perspective, that uh, was very future looking and, and had all of these uh, great premises. Uh, but FACE is up, it's running. Uh, version 3.1 of the standard is, is out. Um, industry is using software product lines with FACE requirements across multiple primes and suppliers and seeing a return on those investments. Um, there's a ton of technical and business expertise available. If you look at some of the FACE outreach events, uh, the, the, the efforts with BALSA to uh, get a Hello World type uh, FACE application out there, all of the um, technical interchange meetings and the integration events that, that have been supported have demonstrated that from a technical perspective, folks can build software to face, um, and um, and folks are interested in building software to face. On, on the other side, government has uh, come out with several RF, RFIs, RFPs, programs of record that uh, have face requirements. Um, if you go to the face registry, which we'll talk about in a little bit, there's currently 22 units of conformance that have completed the complete process from 13 software suppliers. And every indication we have is that, that there is a lot more on the way. So the bottom line is that FACE is not something that's coming in the future. It's here today. It's ready to use, and it's ready for folks to develop, too. Uh, here are some consortium members. I won't spend a lot of time here, but um, the, you can see just from the organization of the consortium, they're sponsor-level members, principal-level members, and then associate uh, members. Um, it's the face uh, is broken up into the business working group, technical working group, and then um, there's the enterprise architecture standing committee and the domain interoperability working group are, are sort of the main uh, or the organizational structure of, of the consortium. A few common misconceptions just as before we get started in talking about some of the details on conformance and the face library uh, that, uh, that we'll address. Um, particularly, we found this is helpful for folks who are, or sh who are uh, participating for the first time, um, is that uh, all face platform software must be face, con all platform software must be face conformant. conformant. That is a misconception. Um, what the, those pieces of uh, software that, um, uh, that are or are not uh, face conformant on a particular platform or program, um, those, that's a business case that the uh, that individual PM um, um, will need to work through, but there's nothing inherent about FACE that, that requires everything on a platform to be FACE conformant. Lots of folks have concerns around um, uh, data rights um, and, um, and how FACE Im impacts industry's ability to maintain their IP. There's nothing <clears throat> inherent about FACE that has uh, makes any claim on, on um, software intellectual property or data rights. All of those things, just like in any other program, require um, clear, clear contractual language to spell out 
what the, the either the government or a systems integrator is going to acquire and those that they're not. Um, and, and FACE, as you'll see here in a bit, has provided a, a good deal of guidance to help uh, both uh, software developers and um, uh, program managers or integrators uh, think through those issues. FACE only applies to future systems, not true. There's lots of efforts going on right now to apply FACE to the current fleet. That, uh, another misconception is that FACE uh, somehow guarantees or, or prevents airworthiness qualification. Again, nothing about FACE, and, and, and we'll talk to you in a bit, FACE really is uh, talking about software interfaces, and there's nothing about FACE that either uh, guarantees that you'll uh, be airworthy if you develop something in the FACE standard or prevents it. That, that being said, there's, there's lots of work going on to assist uh, software developers and integrators and program managers to be able to reuse artifacts that were generated for FACE conformance for other qualification processes, including your weakness. Misconception about FACE is that it either ensures or inhibits performance. Talk about this more, but FACE does not test your unit of conformance for, funct for functionality. It only tests for whether it uh, aligns or uh, meets the requirements of the FACE technical standard. And that it's cost and schedule prohibitive. Again, nothing about FACE, um, and, and, and we believe this has been demonstrated um, is particularly uh, costly or time-consuming from a software um, development perspective. Okay, there's, there's lots of, um, and we'll talk about where you can find these, but there's lots of work that's been done in the consortium over the past several years to um, support development of the standard and to support uh, folks being able to develop uh, and acquire uh, software that's been developed to the FACE standard. Here's just a sample of some of those um, products that are available to you. Um, if, you were, if you're interested in developing to, to the standard, we'll talk about where you can find some of this information. But uh, again, as we said before, all of the work products, once they get through the internal approval processes uh, for FACE are uh, publicly available and anybody in the world can develop uh, FACE units of conformance. Just real quick for those that are interested in participating this week in the business working group, uh, we kind of have two, uh, two um, uh, focuses that, that we've taken. One is kind of a strategic longer term focus uh, led up by James Doty, who's the, um, the BWG chair and Chip Downing, who's the chair of the outreach subcommittee, looking uh, forward and looking at uh, uh, things that are, that are coming down the pipe and where we wanna be you know, next year, five years down the road. The other side of the work with of the business working group is um, ensuring the processes that we've got today, conformance, some of our library tools, um, our problem reporting and change request, request processes are working and, and um, those, uh, those current trains are, are being run on time. Uh, for this week, we've got two sessions. There's one uh, tomorrow afternoon and then one uh, Wednesday afternoon. The first session will be uh, focused on outreach, upcoming events, um, and uh, some of the near-term uh, focus work. And then the second session will be more general all, all hands, and we'll talk about some of the, um, uh, some items related to face roadmap. So how are we looking forward and, and where do we, you know, Joe talked a little this morning about um, evolution of the face technical standard. But, uh, where do we see that from a, a timeline? Um, and then what are all the events to the left of, let's just say, uh, the next either minor or major uh, version of the FACE technical standard that need to happen uh, to support that? And we'll also talk about some of the website updates and um, uh, some other things during that second session tomorrow. So uh, if you have an interest in some of the, the FACE business processes, please join us uh, for those two sessions this week. So I'll stop here, pause. If, if there's anybody got any quick questions on the overview, uh, we can try to address them. Um, next, we'll talk a, about, a little bit about some of the, um, the more specific products and processes, the contract guide, business guide, um, and then uh, some outreach items. And like I said before, I am, I am trying to keep us uh, right, right about to an hour so folks can make the TWG at uh, 3.15 Eastern. All right, thank you for your attention. And like I said, if you do have questions, go ahead and uh, just submit them in the, uh, the chat box and, and we will uh, we'll try to address them. We'll also uh, try to make some time at the end for just any general questions. But uh, next up, 
will be uh, Jason York to talk about uh, contract guide and the business guide. Thank you, Brendan. So uh, I want to talk to you just uh, briefly about the uh, FACE contract guide and the FACE business guide. Uh, but before I do that, I kind of want to, you know, set the stage, give you a little bit of background of why we think, you know, these are important, and then discuss the aspects of each. Next slide, please. Uh, Brent, can you advance? Sorry about that. Hey, no, no problem. Thank you. So over the last 20 months, uh, we've seen a significant amount of modular open system approach guidance come out. Uh, back in January of 19, uh, there was a tri-services memo. Uh, we were very excited about that because it specifically called out uh, FACE as an open standard. Got a couple of quotes. Uh, you know, from that memo, and uh, shortly after that, um, the Secretary of the Navy, you know, issued uh, an instruction uh, that was already in the works, but but that that kind of expanded upon that and emphasized the uh, the importance of MOSA for the Navy. Uh, the Army Acquisition Executive, uh, back earlier this year, uh, put out a uh, policy. You know, Formosa that is that was specifically uh, derived from the Tri Services memo, and most recently the Secretary of the Air Force issued an instruction um, back at back towards the end of, uh, of June. So, just wanted to make sure that you're aware of all the Mosa guidance that we've received over a very short period of time, and there are you know follow on more detailed you know guidance coming out but this is this isn't something for a specific service this is this is really dod wide and uh, if you're interested in more details on this we actually have it in the uh, face business guide 3.0 that uh, will be published uh soon so you know, hopefully by the end of this week or uh, maybe next week but uh, it's definitely in the pipeline and uh, should come out so you can uh, read more about this so why is this important? Uh, next slide, please. So MOSA and the FACE approach. Um, and to understand MOSA, there are really five principles that it's broken uh, down to. Uh, I've got them listed here. And the FACE approach actually addresses each one of those uh, principles. So why is the, the face approach uh, important because if you follow the face approach now granted it's restricted uh, to the software domain that's what we are is a is a component level uh, standard you know for software but if you follow the face approach you address all five of the most uh, principles or at least it, it, it greatly helps you uh, address all five of the most principles so that's why uh, it's really important Next slide. So the FACE Contract Guide 3.0, uh, this was recently published in June, uh, right before the, uh, the virtual 10 year anniversary uh, meeting. So the intent of the contract guide is to help with uh, defining requirements, help with the creation of solicitation you know, with FACE requirements. It actually provides sample language an acquiring PM can go in and reuse Taylor for their you know, specific needs. And it's broken down, uh, the original version, version 1.0, is, is focused on requests for proposals. So that's you know broken down in the, in the specific things that you, that you typically see, statement of work, section L, section M, section H, and uh, deliverables. So in the deliverables, um, coverage of the contract guide, there's a table and it goes through the standard software deliverables and any specific tailoring that you would need uh, for FACE. And one thing that, that's really telling is FACE doesn't require additional software deliverables. It are C drills. You know, when you start talking about you know additional C drills, PMs start thinking time and money. Well, we fit context of the deliverables that's already currently, you know, out there and common in, in acquiring software. So uh, for version two of the contract guide, we expanded it. We were seeing a lot of requests for information coming out. So 
For version two, we added request for information section and gave some uh, example topics that covers a few different things, including uh, data architecture, data modeling. And then the most recent version, we expanded that into broad agency announcements and other transaction, transaction authority uh, topics because we were seeing, uh, you know, a good bit of that, uh, you know, coming out. Um, you know, just for, you know, this may be old hat to, to most people, but the broad agency announcement, uh, it does follow the FAR 30-016. And you can use that for acquisition of basic and applied research, but it can't be specifically related to a, a specific system or a hardware procurement. Now, the OTA is not governed by the FAR, but it gives um, the government the authority to carry out certain prototype projects. So it, it really helps streamline, and what we're seeing here is acquisition of innovative research and prototypes from industry and academia. So I'm sure that, you know, most of you are, are seeing uh, things come out, opportunities come out in BAAs or OTAs, so we decided to expand the contract guide to cover those. And um, as far as this, um, there's many different ways uh, for the acquiring PGM. You know, we didn't want it to be cookie cutter, so we took a, a standard approach, but we also provided uh, commentary boxes which shows other ways to um, to ask for certain things. Maybe you don't want to have, um, you know, a, a separate risk management plan and a quality assurance plan. Maybe, you, maybe it's a pretty small percentage. You want to roll that into a software development plan. We've got commentary uh, in there to give you some, some options. We couldn't enumerate uh, all the potential cases in acquiring PM uh, mine encounter, but we tried to uh, cover most that we it feels pretty common. And the contract guide, the focus is, like I said, acquiring PMs and their staff to, to actually, where the rubber meets the road, to go out and, and make procurement um, with products with that, that satisfy face requirements to, to uh, acquire uh, that software. Next slide. Now, now the business guide, the business guide version uh, 3.0, uh, like I mentioned, it is going to be published. It's in the final stages of, of uh, publication, so uh, it should wrap up and uh, we'll, we'll get that out published and make it publicly available. It is more of an outreach uh, document, and it goes over the value and benefit of the government and industry and how they are addressed. And what you will see, uh, you know, in that is a lot of this makes it about it, how that, how the face approach is, is satisfying um, the, the MOSA guide, and it is uh, the reason why you should follow uh, the face approach. So that, those are the, you know, the, the two assets um, that I wanted to cover with you today. Next slide. A quick summary. Uh, Comparing the uh, face contract guide, the business guide, who's our intended audience, and, and what is the purpose. And uh, if you have any, you know, questions about this, we've got uh, contact information for James, Brendan, uh, and myself. We'll, we'll be happy to uh, engage with you, provide you uh, anything you need uh, on either of those. Okay, Jason, thank you. And uh, Mr. Matthew, Matthew Drew, I, I see your question there. That's a great question. Um, I, I promise you we'll come back and we'll address that. Uh, I'd like to keep moving here, um, and, and primarily so I, I, I give Chip enough time at the end, and then we'll, we'll come back and definitely uh, talk to that. Um, so next topic is to just talk, uh, talk about face conformance and, and that process, and perhaps we'll address some of your, uh, your questions here. Uh, kind of the, the why, what, who, and how uh, related to the FACE program. And so what, what is FACE conformance? Um, it's an assessment um, of, of a software in, I'm in, item or domain-specific data model uh, known as a unit of conformance to the applicable conformance requirements in the technical standard. So uh, the, uh, that which gets certified is, is known as a unit of conformance. 
and it gets uh, certified against the FACE technical standard. So as um, briefly discussed a bit earlier, it is not a measure, a measure of any of the, or, uh, of the functionality or performance of the software that's to be being developed, only um, alignment to the FACE technical standard, primarily, uh, and, and it's how those interfa interfaces uh, align to the technical standard. Some verification evidence uh, is uh, done by inspection, uh, but, uh, but there's no functional testing as part of the FACE performance process. So if you're, uh, you know, you, you, your algorithm adds two plus two, FACE will not be checking to make sure the answer is, is uh, four. And uh, if it's five, it, it, won't, it, it can still be FACE conformant. Um, and it's also not a guarantee of a plug and play solution. So FACE does not um, eliminate the need for systems engineering, um, uh, but it likely reduces the, the, level, the engineering requirements in order to reuse that software. Um, and so when we talk about FACE, and, and, and if you've been around the open group for any number of time, uh, certain folks will beat you up about um, uh, being very precise in some of the language. Um, but there is no compliance to the conformance standard. There's no alignment to the FACE standard. It's either certified conformant or it is not. And what that means is completed the, it's completed the, uh, all of the steps in the FACE conformance process. Systems don't get uh, necessarily a FACE certification. Um, uh, only those units of conformance are, are, are what gets certified. And a, a system or a subsystem can be made of both uh, FACE certified UOCs or, or, or uh, software components that don't align to the FACE standard. Um, and there's currently no FACE certification for things like independent libraries, runtimes, and frameworks. Uh, so, so why why do the face conformance process, or why do face conformance? And as Jason highlighted earlier, uh, one of the most uh, um, um, tenets was was having um, uh, certification. And so, face provides a level of competence that uh, that the unit of conformance does comply to the technical standard. So. Uh, we'll talk a little bit here about some of the roles uh, in the in the the face conformance process. And you, as you read some of the documents that Jason described earlier, you can get more details about about each of these. But uh, we talk about the software supplier, and um, let me just say, often companies can can fill um, well uh, a few different roles. But the software supplier generally is that that uh, entity that's developing software to the standard. Uh, so that could be an integrator or the original developer or, or anybody else that wants to get a uh, uh, get get some software certified. Face verification authorities have been um, approved by the Face Steering Committee, and there are are several of them. I believe right now there are four Face VAs. Uh, some of them are government organizations. Some of them are commercial entities. But those are the uh, those are within face. That is who um, um, conducts that uh, uh, for the record tests that um, 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 tests your software against the face technical standard. And then once that's complete, they provide the verification evidence for the face certification authority. So there is a single face certification authority. Currently, it is the Open Group. And that's the organization that's required or that's responsible for ensuring that all of the uh, paperwork from the VA has been complete, all of the uh, data about a uh, face uh, UOC has been provided. And then at the end of the day, they're the ones uh, to provide that face conformance certificate. Uh, in addition to that, there's also some um, uh, benefit that they provide from a uh, uh, trademark and a, and a uh, maintaining the, the, uh, the brand of the FACE uh, perspective. And then additionally, there's the FACE library administrator. So uh, that's the entity also being performed by the open group currently that um, is responsible for managing the listing of the FACE, uh, uh, that of the FACE certified units of conformance um, that, are, that are published uh, publicly available in the FACE registry. So just a, a very high-level uh, diagram of the, the process that, that 
that uh, the face conformance program lays out. Before a software supplier gets started, there's, a, there's some work to be done to the left of the process, uh, which is preparation. So that's understanding what's involved in developing the software, doing your homework, um, and then uh, building your software. When, when a software supplier is ready, they can initiate verification of that software that's been developed. Uh, and to do that, they will coordinate with one of those face verification authorities. Uh, that is a um, contractual relationship between that software supplier and the face verification authority. There's a cost associated with getting that uh, unit of or that software uh, verified. That cost will vary, um, and it's a market uh, set price. So um, depending on how complicated your software is, the cost may be relatively low or high. Um, once that process is complete, then the software supplier can initiate certification of that unit of that uh, that software. Uh, they'll provide some uh, paperwork. They'll uh, provide um, um, you know they'll acknowledge the terms and conditions of using the face brand, the face logo, all of those things. And then they there is also a fee that uh, I believe is about nine hundred and eighty dollars right now. Uh, to get that uh, unit of or that software uh, fully certified. Then when the software supplier wants to, they can register that software in the, uh, the face registry. So uh, they can make that, um, that face certified unit of conformance publicly available for folks to discover. So whether you're a systems integrator or, or a government program person, there's one place to go to discover face um, software. So a few takeaways. Uh, in face, the, the uh, software is either fully has completed the uh, face conformance process or it's not. So there's no there's no such thing as being almost face or aligned to the face standard or compliant with the, the technical you know, regulations of the face standard. It's either been through the process or it's not. If you want to learn more about conformance, um, if you go to opengroup.org/face, there's a conformance tab. And then for everything we've we've um, uh, you know over the last couple of years, the uh, one of the keys to success to navigating through this process is getting with your verification authority early. They are the technical experts on on doing face conformance certification, um, and those folks can help you out. Um, um, can help you navigate through the, the the most difficult part of the process, which is getting uh, the technical certification complete. So that's a bit about face conformance and the process, and um, um, I'll talk next about the face library. So um, I'll go through these relatively quickly, but uh, face has provided uh, infrastructure to discover um, uh, units of conformance that have completed the process. Um, in addition, there's a, there's a few web tools, a web page, um, and a couple other tools that uh, support um, communicating uh, information about FACE and also some of the certification processes um, uh, that we'll talk about here in a second. So we have this, um, uh, something called the FACE registry. It's at facesoftware.org slash registry. And as we discussed before, uh, only software that has completed the entire FACE conformance process is listed in the registry. So once it's complete, then at the software suppliers, um, Initiation, they can publish that into the registry, and the world can can discover their their uh, face unit of conformance. The registry is kind of set up like an Amazon. You can filter for different characteristics. You can search the, the registry, and the purpose there is to promote discovery of face applications. Uh, when we get to um, um, how you're going to actually acquire or get that face unit of conformance, uh, that is uh, that that then moves into a, a kind of a one-on-one -on -one contractual inter interaction between a software supplier and the acquiring party. Um, we have something called the FACE landing page, which a lot of you I'm sure have seen, but it's at opengroup.org slash FACE. And here's where you can find lots of information on generally about the consortium, when the next meetings are. And then uh, this is really the gateway to all of that publicly available FACE uh, information, the documents and things that we talked about. Uh, a few slides earlier. To support um, gathering the metadata that eventually will populate in the FACE registry, the, um, the government members of the consortium have developed and, and provided to the open group 
um, a workflow tool so users can log in. Um, you can provide metadata about your unit of conformance, and then there are steps in the process to uh, get that metadata published into the registry. And as you can see at the, the top, that workflow in the workflow tool uh, maps to the, um, the high level diagram we talked about a bit earlier for the conformance process. And then the face registry, as I, as I mentioned, is where users can go and view those uh, units of conformance that have completed the process and that are available um, uh, to be acquired. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that all of those face documents, once they're complete, the internal open group review process are publicly available. So anybody in the world can get them and develop face conformance software. Um, for those users that don't have access to something like the the face-to-face -face meetings, or for anybody that has a problem developing um, using those published documents and tools, <clears throat> we also have a problem reporting and change request um, web tool. So any user can come here, can, can log in, uh, their information is anonymized when it gets submitted, but they can um, uh, either provide recommendations for uh, improving the existing face document or tool, or if they have a problem developing to the standard, they can communicate that. When things come into the tool, they get adjudicated, they get sent to the right uh, folks within the consortium to address them. If they're routine matters, they get put on a certain uh, track to get addressed. If it's something that's preventing a user from developing to the standards, say one of our tools is not working as advertised or there's a problem that, that uh, the consortium wasn't aware of, that gets on an accelerated timeline to be addressed. And so the face library, as I said, um, uh, everything uh, contains a few web, few tools, the website, the problem reporting change request process and the registry primarily. And it's really about supporting the infrastructure for developing and, and um, discovering those face UOCs. Okay, uh, still haven't forgotten about the, the questions in the chat. We'll get, we'll uh, uh, chip, you're up and I'll click through your slides and then we'll come back and address uh, those questions and then anything else. And then that way folks who need to move on to the uh, TWG, uh, we're not holding. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep, got you on clear, Chip. Perfect, next slide, please. So I am Chip Downing. I am the Senior Market Development Director at Real-Time Innovations. I also am the FACE BWG Outreach Chair. Uh, we have a committee that's uh, formed to promote FACE globally. Uh, here's our charter right here about the, uh, promoting the adoption and support of the FACE technical standard and business approach. Uh, these efforts include developing, coordinating messaging, education, events, outreach efforts, whatever it takes for uh, supporting a global aerospace defense audience. Next slide, please. So today's, uh, or I think it's, yeah, I think it's today's outreach agenda. Uh, during the BWG meeting, uh, we'll, we tip, typically go through uh, new announcements and updates, and there's typically always something that changes almost every meeting. We'll talk about the, the different uh, uh, government speaking opportunities. We look at our five-year strategy. We have Army, Navy, and Air Force uh, update uh, the team on their uh, commitments. Uh, also take a look at uh, some uh, uh, activities, uh, events that are uh, coming up here in the, in the near future. Next slide, please. Uh, things change. Certainly COVID has made a lot of things change. We, uh, we're going to have a FACE technical interchange meeting, and that's a, an event sponsored by the FACE Consortium and its members where we meet at a facility and demonstrate our uh, face conformant and or face aligned products uh, together. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, in the Holiday Inn in Solomon's uh, in a couple of weeks. It's not going to happen now. It's now been pushed off to March 23rd, 2020 at the same location. Uh, this is an event that's open to everybody. It's free. There's no cost to attend. There may be a slight cost to exhibit, but uh, in most cases, it's free. It's, it, anybody can come in, including folks from uh, outside the United States. So it's not a, 
an ITAR or any type of US only type of event, it is uh, open to everyone. So it's a good a venue to see all the different partner integration stacks, to see the different players uh, organized together, uh, and uh, just uh, network with everybody on the team. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, Chip, uh, this is yes, James. Sir. Yes. Just to, just to clarify, the date is 2021 for the next time, not 2020. I think oh. it was incorrectly marked on that chart. Ah, you're right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, just, just making sure. <laughs> yeah, the dates change so much. I'll, I know I'll get something wrong here. So on this slide, I was smart. I did not put a year in. But the uh, same thing happened with the Aerospace Tech Week. It was supposed to happen in March. Then it was supposed to happen next March, 2021. And just this week, it was announced that they've uh, now pushed that out to June 9th and 10th in Toulouse, France. And if you've ever been to France in the summer times, Toulouse is a great place to go, especially the first week of June, a couple of weeks of June. So uh, I, I hope uh, everybody can go there. Uh, this is not a phase consortium sponsored event. This is sponsored by Aerospace Tech Week. Uh, there is exhibition play, uh, space available for face members and other uh, companies that are exhibiting face conformant and, for, and or face aligned products. But uh, there's a few spots left, and I think with this the data extension, we'll probably do a, uh, a sellout at this event. So it's, uh, uh, keep this in mind as you go forward. Uh, put this into your travel plans, your uh, business networking plans. If you are trying to uh, sell your face uh, conformer products over in Europe, this is a great place to uh, try to do that. If you like being a face ambassador to uh, European nations, this is also a great place to do that. Next slide, please. Any questions? So next slide, uh, I think there's some contact information here. Uh, one more, there you go. So the uh, presenters are uh, James Doty, Brendan O'Donnell, uh, Chip Downey, and Jason York. Feel free to contact us if you have uh, any questions whatsoever. Back to you, Brendan. Hey, James. Uh, thanks, Chip. I just, and I just wanted, uh, Sally Bixby, if you're online, I just wanted to uh, uh, emphasize Lauren sent out uh, earlier, I believe last Friday, a link with the with the registration that uh, for the, the the September 21st Tim, um, the event in Salt to still get canceled, and the in person portion of that is getting moved to uh, next March. But there is uh, there is an event the 21st, uh, so a week from today, next Monday. Um, where the, the papers are going to be presented. Uh, Sally or, or uh, uh, Alicia, if there's anything I missed there or wasn't clear about, please let me know. Yeah, no, actually, Brendan, this is Sally. Thank you for reiterating that. Lauren did send out a reminder to ask folks to register for the TIM next Monday. Uh, we're looking forward to a great event. It's actually got several papers from FACE uh, being presented, and there's two tracks, so that's open. And then, yes, indeed, we are looking forward to the Expo live and in person on March 23rd and having a lot of the exhibitors and all of the new uh, products and achievements uh, be showcased. So thank you for uh, pointing that out. I appreciate it. Alicia, anything in addition, please, ma'am? Um, I would just say that there are nine FACE uh, uh, topic-related papers. And I think there's an additional five or so SOSA papers, and even some of the SOSA papers uh, uh, show the interaction relationship between um, FACE and SOSA uh, technical standards working together. So um, we're very, very excited about this. This is um, a situation where if it hadn't been virtual, all the authors would not be able to present. And so we are very, very excited that um, the authors of, of all nine papers are able to present at the uh, the, the town. So thank you. Yeah. And and one additional comment. Uh, I apologize, Brendan, for shanghaiing the meeting real quick. On the Tim uh, next week, once uh, we are um, uh, with our sponsor Adacor, who's kicking it off, and then Captain Wilson, who will be giving opening remarks. That's when we will shift off to two tracks. I wanted to share the news that the start of track two is actually uh, Chris Crook, who will be doing a face introduction 
uh, and then he will uh, share the microphone with uh, Patrick Collier, who's going to do a SOSA one. But that's right off the bat after the opening remarks happen uh, at the TIM next Monday. Thank you. And that's open to? To no, the public. Thanks. It's free to attend. Yep. So uh, thank you for those updates. Okay, so we have uh, about 17 minutes until the TWG brief starts. Um, I'll, we'll shift. So no, number one, thank you for your 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 time and attention. I want to try to keep us on schedule, um, and so we'll go to the question, uh, Matthew, that that you had, and uh, for folks who, who might not be able to see the chat, and the question is, can you explain a bit about the emphasis on low cost? It is my understanding that gaining conformance can be expensive and time-consuming process. How you market this to new UOC developers slash companies interested in throwing in? Uh, how can you market this? To new companies interested in throwing in their hat to the face development community, so uh, um, I, I will say just, and I want to make sure we were um, precise about this earlier in the brief. When we talk about, and I think particularly from the government perspective, um, uh, reducing costs, what we're really talking about is reducing integration costs and, and enabling uh, DoD to spend its investment dollars on capabilities that are going to go to the warfighter and not spending those resources on uh, kind of dead weight integration. Uh, costs. Um, and so uh, there's, there's definitely other folks on, on this call who can talk more about the from a technical perspective, um, the, uh, the, the, the time and the cost um, uh, for developing a face UOC. But I think, um, as Chris um, alluded to in, in his comment in the chat, uh, generally not more expensive. Um, but but a lot of that's going to be a function of the complexity of the unit of conformance that you're trying to get uh, certified. Um, and so I think you have to look at it as compared to what. Um, uh, and and the, does and the question is does face does developing a, a piece of software to the face standard uh, add appreciably more time and effort uh, or cost than um, than if you were developing that software to another standard perhaps. Uh, Chris, if you're on the line, is there anything else you'd like to talk to there? Nope. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, I hope that answered your question, um, Matthew. And, and um, if there's other questions, I'm happy to, to stay on the line for, for a while, but I did, I did want to um, uh, allow our folks to uh, to get a quick break before they have to be back for the, uh, the TWG overview. Are there any other business related, uh, face business overview related questions? Just one last comment, Brendan, sorry, it's Sally again. Uh, I'm also excited to announce that Jill Carter is giving the closing remarks uh, at the TIM next Monday. So uh, Jill, forgive me for not mentioning that up front. We're thrilled to have you do so, thanks. And so, um, uh, so for folks who, who are, are new to FACE, uh, please, you know, you saw a couple names on there. Uh, my name, Brendan O'Donnell, Jason York, Chip Downing, James Doty, who's the chair of the BWG. Uh, if there's anything in particular that um, you want a deeper dive on um, or get a demonstration of or have specific questions from a, from a, a business perspective, if, particularly if you're looking to advocate for FACE in your organization and you need materials to help um, um, describe uh, why, you know, why, why the face approach and some of the benefits there. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us if we, you know, if uh, we can't do it this week because of the, the face meeting, we're happy to do it uh, kind of a one-on-one -on -one session uh, with anybody, um, you know, over the next couple of weeks to get you the information you need. Um, and with, with that, I don't see any other questions. I'll, I'll give about five more seconds and if anybody wants to Post one, great, and if not, then I uh, appreciate your waste time, and um, we will talk to you later this week, and please join us for the uh, business working group uh, sessions tomorrow and Wednesday.